Today, um, we're going to continue our series in the Gospel of Luke, and I want to talk to you about definitions. Definitions are really important. I want to ask you what defines you, what defines your life, what defines the way you practice faith, because how you do that, how you define yourself really matters. Definitions, you know, we define everything in our culture. We have a two-party system, predominantly a two-party system, that have a party platform, and they're defined by those platforms. In high school, the jocks were defined as the people that like sports and occasionally weren't as smart as everyone else. Um, Sorry, jocks, no offense. I was one of them, if that makes you feel better, for a little bit. Then I became a geek. And so, so you have definitions that way. You, you have other definitions like, you know, the Steelers are defined by the first team that reached six Super Bowls. Tom Brady is defined as the player that cries the most in football, <laughs> on and on. Um, definitions matter. In religion, we see religions have different definitions for how they function. If you're a, a Muslim, you'd be defined by the Shahada and by following the five pillars of Islam. Definitions matter. They're clarifying. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 33 and pick up right where we left off last week. And as we see this orderly account that Luke is putting together for us to show us who Jesus really is. And so far we've seen that Jesus is on a mission to proclaim liberty to captives, to put sight back in the eyes of the blind, to free the oppressed. We see that he's, he's willing to associate himself with tax collectors and sinners. We've seen that he's willing to heal people society is far from. And today, we're going to see that Jesus is redefining the heart of God toward the world. Jesus redefines the heart of God for the world. So if you haven't yet, Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. We'll look at verse 33 and we'll carry through to chapter 6, verse 11. God's word says, Then they, that is the Pharisees, said to him, John's disciples fast often and say prayers, and those of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, You can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wines into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It will spill and the skins will be ruined. No new wine is put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants new because he says the old is better. On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. But some of the Pharisees says, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, haven't you read what David and those who were with him did when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. He even gave some to those who were with him. Then he told them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered a synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The scribes and Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so they could find a charge against him. But he knew their thoughts and told the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at them all, he told them, told him, stretch out your hand. He did, and his hand was restored. They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. As we work through our passage today, we'll just have two simple points, two simple ways Jesus redefines God's heart for the world. 
And first thing he does is he redefines our relationship to God. That is how we relate to him. And he does this through this, all of this talk about fasting. And we're dropping into kind of the middle of a dialogue. There's some days pass between events in our passage. We're dropping into a, a, the middle of a dialogue where Jesus is having, in, increasingly having conflicts with Pharisees. We saw this last week because they were upset that Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors, people f- far from God, these, these people that kind of sold their soul to the Roman culture. And let's remember that Pharisees are the religious elite of the day. It's really easy to be hard on Pharisees, but I don't want to be too hard on them lest we're not able to see ourselves as one of them sometimes. So the Pharisees are the religious elites. They're the theological conservatives. They are the moral high ground people. They're like the people looking for a moral majority in their culture. They're good neighbors. They're the people that had all their stuff together. Their lawn was always mowed, right? They're the you know, they did nice edge work on their lawn. Like everything looked good. They're the people that, you know, never violated HOA rules or anything like that. And they were the gatekeepers of culture and religion at the time. They were worried that, that the Roman occupation would cause a dilution in what it meant to follow after God. And they come to this portion in this passage, we come to this portion in this passage, and we see that there's a question about fasting. And fasting is one of those religious practices that a lot of us um, don't really practice anymore. But fasting was a common spiritual practice, and we can see fasting throughout the Old Testament. We see David fasting. We see Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights when God was giving him the Ten Commandments and the law. Fasting was also a time to plead with God and to break in. And apparently, John the Baptist's uh, disciples, they, they fasted regularly. And the Pharisees also make note that, that they fast. And they notice that Jesus' disciples don't fast. And they confront Jesus about this. And they said, you know, John's disciples fasted. Our disciples fast. But your disciples party a lot. It's basically what's going on. They're not fasting. Help me understand. And Jesus responds with a pretty fun statement in verse 34. He says to them, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. Kind of interesting. They start talking about fasting. Jesus starts talking about weddings. And in, the, in, in this analogy, he is the groom of the wedding. And he's saying that, hey, when there's a wedding, when the groom and the bride are together, you don't fast, right? Like that would be, that would be silly to have a wedding and fast. Though some of you are planning weddings and you're gonna see how much it is per head. Like come through and you might be tempted. Maybe we could fast. But... <laughs> But that would be ridiculous, right? Because it's a party. It's a reason to celebrate. And Jesus' reply is that he is with his people and his kingdom is breaking in. This is no occasion for fasting. This is an occasion to celebrate. He is here. And as long as Jesus is here, there is reason to celebrate and feast and party. Fasting will come later, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you see, Jesus is redefining for the Pharisees, for people there, the God's heart towards the world. Jesus is redefining God's heart towards the world. The Pharisees didn't understand that the Messiah was here, that Jesus was here, and that that. And they had all of these really rigid rules, rules for, for trying to get God to bless them, rules for trying to manage their culture, rules for how to keep everyone in line. And Jesus comes along and the kingdom starts breaking through. And what the Pharisees had, they have a scarcity mindset that God can't show up unless their religious rules and practices were followed to a T. And what What Jesus comes and shows is that when his kingdom 
breaks in, there is not scarcity, but there is an abundance of goodness and there is an abundance of grace. Jesus comes in and he redefines God's heart towards the world, not as one stand back from the world, but one entering into the world and changing it. God is a God of grace. And the Pharisees had determined that if God was to act, they would define what that would be. And Jesus doesn't just leave it there, but he decides to tell a parable. Now, if you're new to church, um, we're all kind of familiar with some parables, like the parable of the prodigal son. Culturally, that's, that's well known. But we're gonna encounter a lot of parables in Luke. And so I'm probably gonna throw a couple different definitions at you. But for today, a parable in, is, in its broadest sense is an expanded analogy that uses the God-given gift of imagination to reflect a real reality. It's an expanded analogy that uses like our gift to imagine things to reflect a real reality. And so he tells a parable, and this is basically how it goes. I'm gonna summarize. Jesus tells a parable about a couple of different things. The first are about garments. And he starts talking about that if you have a garment, you wouldn't rip apart a new garment to put a patch on an old garment, right? Like for the you sewers in here, would you, would you, if you had like an old, like cruddy pair of jeans that were falling apart, you wouldn't go take a new pair of jeans that were the same size and be like, cut out like that, that square and like affix it on the, on the old jeans, would you? That would be ridiculous, right? Because the new jeans are superior and, and you wouldn't rip a new garment to fix something old. You would just wear the new ones. So this is what Jesus is saying, that, the, like, that he's doing something new. And then the other thing he uses is, um, is this wineskins and wine metaphor, this analogy. So in that culture, when you would ferment wine, they would often take an animal, and I did a little research on it. It's kind of gross. They would actually use the throat and trachea of the animal to pour the wine into the wineskin, which is often the, the um, dried out skins of the animal. And what they would do is they would, would fill up, put new wine in new wineskins, and that would ferment and expand the wineskins and it could hold it. But you wouldn't put new wine in old wineskins because old wineskins were already stretched out. And if you put new wine in old wineskins, the old wineskin can't contain the new wine. And what Jesus is saying is that the way the Pharisees think and the way that he thinks are two entirely different things. The Pharisees had this like very modified form of Judaism where they were controlling, they were legalists, hyper rigid in their law following. And Jesus is saying that what he's doing can't be contained in what they're doing. That he is doing all t- something altogether new and something all together different. And then it was going to change, redefine their understanding of how God relates to the world and how they relate to him. Jesus is doing something new and different than the Pharisees. And then he says in verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine wants new because he says the old is better. Pharisees valued traditionalism. And this might seem like a a positive statement about the old wine. But what Jesus is saying here is essentially telling the Pharisees, I'm doing something new. You can't perceive it and you're stuck in your ways. You will not trade in that old wine because you think it's better than the new, but it's not. And that is what Jesus is saying. They won't get on board with what Jesus is doing in the world. The Pharisees' understanding of God was much smaller than what Jesus was saying and showing about him. In what Jesus is saying that he cannot be adapted to fit what the Pharisees are doing. He is gonna do something new. And he's defining the heart of God towards the world is one of abundance 
is, is one of lavish grace that spills out to the least of these, to the lost, to the tax collectors, to the sinners, that heals people with leprosy, that, that heals and binds up broken hearts. The Pharisees wouldn't have this new thing. They couldn't understand it. They would have rather Jesus follow their rules than get on board with the new thing that Jesus is doing. Their understanding of God meant God was limited to act in a certain way. And that if they didn't act in their way, then he wasn't acting. They misunderstood. And I just want to take a moment and kind of like step, carry the text into our lives a little bit. Some of us have this, this way of thinking and it's really easy to fall into this pharisaical way of thinking that to be a Christian, you must fill in the blank. Or you're not a Christian if blank. Or God doesn't work in blank. And fill in that blank. You, oh, like we, we have all of the things. Like we have our theological tribes. That if, and we have our, you know, just different things we think. We can have our own rules. But what Jesus is saying that God is much more lavish and abundant with grace than we can imagine. And, and there's others of us that live in such a way like the Pharisees that we want Jesus as long as he is a nice add-on to our lives. We want to take a new garment and put it on an old pair of pants with the way that we relate to Jesus. We want to maintain the way that we live and do things, but we don't want to actually get on board with Jesus. And I think that this is a warning for us that we are going to be tempted to, to fit, make God fit in our box. Jesus cannot be an add-on. He cannot be contained. And some of us want to live in such a way that he is not Lord over certain areas of our lives. But Jesus says that that is not the way things work. To, to get on board with Jesus, you're going to need to follow him. And let him define you. We have a God who is a God of abundance, who gives of himself freely. He is more than the limits we place on him. And one of the things that Jesus says is that one day that fasting will come. And I want to talk about this because if we're going to be people defined by Jesus, we need to understand a little bit about God. See, some of us still relate to God as if he is withholding of his goodness and of his grace, that he isn't lavish with it. And fasting is one of the ways we withhold something good from us and remember that God is lavish with goodness and able to give what we seek him for. Jesus feasted with his disciples and that same God of feasting is a God of fasting. And in our fasting, we remember that he can give us a feast of his grace. We're about to enter a season in the church calendar known as Lent. And now we're, most of us might not come from traditions or backgrounds that observe Lent, but the Lenten season is 40 days before um, Good Friday and, and, and Easter. And it's a time of preparation. Often, this will be used as a time for fasting. Um, many Catholics will give up eating meat on Fridays or something like that. Um, there's also different ways to do this. But the purpose of, the, of fasting is to, is to not participate in something and instead be filled up with God. To remember his goodness, to remember our sin, to remember his grace. So one of the things I want to encourage you as we approach Easter is consider fasting from something for Lent. You can do this from alcohol. You can do it from, from watching cable news. You can do this from giving up social media for 40 days, which is what I do every Lent. Um, and, it's, and we do this to give us time to remember God's abundance of grace in spite of our sin. To reorient us that our God is a God of abundance. And what shows that is the fact that he has given us Christ. So we can seek God 
because he is a God of abundance. You can, you can seek after him. If you feel far from God, you can seek after him and believe that he can draw you close because he isn't a God withholding of love and grace. He is a God who is lavish with it. If some of you are aware of what, like what's happening in broader Christianity right now, like we've seen kind of a perfect picture of what's going on in this passage in our culture. About, or on the February 8th, this is a picture of Hughes Auditorium at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. On February 8th, there was a chapel service that um, began there in just a normal chapel service like any Christian college has. And sometimes Christian colleges have many chapel services a week. But the chapel service, I forget what time it started, but when it concluded, students kept hanging around, praying for each other, and, and confessing sin. And what happened at Asbury is that that chapel service hasn't stopped. Like the Lord just kind of chose to do something with, with the honesty of the students, with the way they were seeking him. And out of his abundance, he showed up in that chapel service. And this chapel service is still going on. Like however many hours and days later, it hasn't stopped 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there are people lining up for hours. And they say that when you go there, there's a strong sense of God's presence in the room, not just not like, and there's no bells and whistles or theatrics or, or anything forcing this to happen. God just chose to rest on this place in a unique way. And one of the most fascinating things was to watch theological Twitter, which is the first level of hell, um, start to say all of the reasons this couldn't be real revival. They start to list all of the boxes that they had for why God wouldn't show up here. And friends, if that's not a picture of the same attitude as the Pharisees, I don't know what is. Because sure, there's gonna be some theology at this thing that I might not agree with. There's gonna be some things that might not make me completely comfortable in this environment and, and fit my theological categories. But do I believe that those things restrain the work of God? Absolutely not. The beauty is we have a God that when people seek him in spite of their flaws, in spite of their faulty systems, he shows up and can do something. And we are invited to rethink our relationship with God as a God who is not withholding, but a God who can show up and meet us. Jesus redefines the heart of God toward the world as a heart bent towards the world in grace. He redefines how we relate to him and he redefines his relationship to us. We come now to the second of three conflicts that Jesus has in our passage today. In this one, we move, it goes from fasting to now Sabbath. Now, Sabbath observation in the Old Testament is really, really clear. Exodus 20, and I think we have it on the screen here, says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. The Sabbath was kind of built into creation, right? Like God made the world in six days, according to Genesis, and he rests on the seventh. And when God led his people out of, out of Israel, they, he would provide the manna from heaven and provide double the amount on the sixth day um, so that they could go out and pick twice as much so they wouldn't have to pick manna on the seventh. And then Exodus 34 says, you are to labor six days, but you must rest on the seventh day. You must even rest during plowing and harvesting times. Sabbath was really important in that culture. And the Pharisees thought very seriously about 
the Sabbath. And they had lots of rules about what you could and could not do on that day. And they even saw this as a sin with communal effects so that if, you're, if someone broke the Sabbath, the whole country could pay for that. And they largely thought of some of their occupation as a result of not keeping Sabbath. And the Pharisees see the disciples with Jesus out in the field, grabbing grain, picking it, rubbing it together and eating what's left. And they're saying that that's a violation of this. And Jesus responds with the story about David. David went into the tabernacle, grabbed the bread of presence, which was only made for priests, ate some and gave it to other people, which was a violation of the Sabbath according to a strict reading of the law. But the Pharisees would have regarded that moment as okay in their understanding because it was David. And so if it was okay for David to do on his mission, he was in the middle of a war, I believe, Jesus is saying, how much more is he permitted to do to, to pick rain on the Sabbath with the kingdom coming in? And then he makes this statement right in verse five of chapter six. He says, powerfully, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And if you're a Pharisee right now, you're cued in on the fact that Jesus is saying that the Sabbath exists for him, that he made it, and that he gets to define what it is to follow the Sabbath and what it is to be faithful to the commands of God in the Old Testament. Jesus is laying claim to the Sabbath, but he's also laying claim to every other day of the week too, because he's equating himself with God, which he is. He is Lord of the Sabbath. He gets to define what it means and what it means to follow it. And then the text continues forward and we see another conflict with the Pharisees. This time, it's with a man with a shriveled hand. And in that time, a, a shriveled hand would have been a sign of judgment, that God was judging this person for something they did. And the Pharisees see Jesus and they see this man with the shriveled hand and they wonder, What's gonna happen with this? Will Jesus heal on the Sabbath? Because in their worldview, in the set, only the necessary things can be done on the Sabbath. Like if that man was gonna die that day, it would have been okay for Jesus to heal him. But because it was just a hand, in their view, he could have, Jesus could have healed him on Monday, right? They can wait another day. He's lived with it for how long? He can wait another day. Because in the Pharisees' understanding of the world, the unclean things made the clean things unclean, right? The leper made the clean dirty. The man with the shriveled hand is a result of judgment and healing him could defile the command. The, in their worldview, the pure, the un, impure tainted the pure. But what we see with Jesus is that it's the other way around, that the impure doesn't taint the pure anymore, but the pure takes the impure and makes it clean. That this is the way Jesus is redefining things, that when God's kingdom breaks forward, it doesn't get tainted by things, it changes things. So, Jesus sees, I love it, says he sees their hearts. He sees their cynicism. He sees their doubts. He sees their anger. And he calls the man in. And he says, stretch out your hand. And he heals it. Because God's kingdom, friends, is breaking into the world. And what it's showing us is that Jesus and God have been after our good and they've been after our good all along. See, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He gets to define what it is. And we understand from this passage and from other passages in the Gospels and in the Old Testament that, this, that man doesn't exist for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath exists for man. That God built this for us in our 
benefit. And the Pharisees had it the other way around. The Sabbath was given for wholeness. And what we're seeing, friends, is that Jesus isn't just throwing off the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus was giving us the proper interpretation of it in himself. Because Jesus didn't come to just demolish the old. He came to fulfill it and redefine it for us. The Sabbath was a gift. And the Sabbath still is a gift. Because what the Sabbath did in the Old Covenant, in that day of resting, in that day of, of not laboring, in a time when you literally had to labor to eat, what the Sabbath did was say, God's people are going to be defined by something completely different. And it was defined by the fact that they have a God who watched over them, cared for them, supplied their needs, met them, even when everything else in the culture said that they should be working more. What that was doing was saying, I know we're not going to work on the seventh day because we are trusting God to provide for us. It was a sign of God's abundance for his people and a sign of what he did in the world. The Pharisees' misinterpretation of God's law literally hindered goodness. But we see in Jesus' redefinition of it that the Sabbath exists for goodness. That when God's kingdom breaks into the world, it isn't hindered. It's let loose. So the Sabbath is actually the perfect place to show forth goodness. And the Pharisees are still drunk on old wine. And they can't see the truth about Jesus. Okay, so what does this look like on the ground? Because, and what does Sabbath, or at least as we'll talk about it here, which is a whole nother sermon, mean for us? Well, friends, like I said before, it's easy to let ourselves be defined by something other than Jesus. And I want to like take a moment as we let ourselves be redefined to, to, to give you permission to follow a Sabbath principle. Now, personally, I don't think that we are required to rigidly follow the Sabbath anymore. In that, we're not required to like strict, you know, rules about when it starts, when it ends. But I don't think we can throw off the whole principle of it so, if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, he is Lord over every day of life as well. We are meant to live lives defined by Jesus. In Sabbath, like a practicing of the Sabbath principle, is a way that we remember God's abundance. You coming to church is one way that we remember God's abundance that he's supplied a family for you, that he's saved you, that he's called you together to be a part of his family. We're not meant to be defined by a theological system or primarily by a voting affiliation or by reputation or egos. We're meant to be defined by Jesus. And so the two practices that we're kind of given in this passage are Sabbath and fasting. We talked about fasting a little bit, that we can yearn for God, believing that he'll meet us. And the second is to step into Sabbath. And here's what I mean by that. I don't mean a limit, a really rigid view. Some of you grew up with that. I went to a school in my undergrad that, that didn't believe that it was okay to play games on the Sabbath. So we had to like, like really, really strict. But a lot of us, we don't have any Sabbath principle at all. We just act like we're just supposed to work. 24-7, or be busy 24-7. And what the Sabbath principle is, it's a reminder to step back and remember that we're not machines and that God is a God of abundance who takes care of us. So here's what that means to practically step into the Sabbath in the abundance of God. One is set aside a day. Set aside a day out of a week. In America, we work two days, we have a two day weekend. Some of us have to work one of those days, but most of us get a day off or a period of time off. You don't have to be super rigid about this, but set aside a day of the week 
where you're not gonna labor. Understand that some labor, you're like, kids are still gonna have to eat, right? Like, but, but set aside like burdensome obligations if you can, some of them, right? Um, and then the second thing is to, one way we practice Sabbath is to receive goodness. Like most of us are wired by culture to be critical and, and to move fastly or to be busy. And what the Sabbath is an invitation to is to slow down and to behold the work of God in the world. And this is what it means. It means doing things like noticing all of the goodness that surrounds you. Point and connect it to your God of abundance. To notice the smile of, and laughter of your children. To notice your spouse again and to thank God for the good gift of providing them. It's, to, it's a day that you can, like if you, some of you love food, but you can have a feast and recognize that God has provided all of these for you because he is a God of abundance who takes care of you. If you love beauty, notice the beauty of the woods, the trees, the snow, whatever, whatever season you're in, notice beauty, notice goodness around you. Recognize the roof over your head that God provided. Recognize the people who might help take care of you. See God, see that God of abundance who meets us in ways we often don't notice. Receive goodness. Ruth Haley Barton is a pastor and she said this quote, which I thought is good. She said, Sabbath keeping is the primary discipline that helps us live within the limits of our humanity and to honor God as our creator. It is the key to a life lived in sync with the rhythms that God himself built into our world. God built this fabric of rest into the world where we remember him as a God of abundance. So we set aside a day, we receive goodness and simply do good. Do what fills you up. Like playing games with your kids, do that. Go bless somebody. The Sabbath is an invitation to receive Jesus and to enter into his rest. The Sabbath is an invitation to see that, that, that we have now entered into rest for the people of God. We don't have to labor to earn God's favor. We have entered into this time where God's favor is abundant and lavish upon us. The Sabbath is an invitation to be defined by Jesus and to be redefined by Jesus, to see that God is a God who takes care of us, provides for us, nourishes us. Some of you today, you might have had a version of Jesus where he is withholding of love and grace. But what we see here today is that we cannot limit Jesus. Some of you have been in church traditions where you've been burned by extra rules and legalism. And what Jesus invites you to is to come taste new wine. It's a wine of grace and of goodness to come seek him, seek him through fasting, seek him through Sabbath and let him meet you with his goodness and abundance. Others of us have devolved from being Jesus people and we've let ourselves be primarily defined by other things. I've listed some of those in our service already. But what if we believed? What if we believed that Jesus could do above and beyond all that we could ask or think? What if we believe that Jesus is so willing to work in this world, that his grace is so abundant that we, that we let ourselves be defined by that? What if we were sent out into the world believing that God can literally change people because he has been all along and he changed you and me? Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of life. And he's come to meet us with abundance. He's come to fill us with his life. 